Hey folks, this is Riker with a video about some beginner tips for Baldur's Gate 3. Dungeons and Dragons has been my lifelong passion. You folks said that you want to see some Baldur's Gate 3 content. So I coordinated with streamer Monkey, who has like a thousand hours into Baldur's Gate 3 early access, to come up with this top 10 list of tips to help you out as you get started in Baldur's Gate 3. And if you have any follow-up questions, you can go check out Monkey's stream, link in the description. Feel free to drop by and ask him anything. So the first thing I'll say before actually diving into the list is that Baldur's Gate 3 is based on Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition rule set. So if you already have some base of knowledge in D&D, like 90 plus percent of that will be transferable to the game. So diving in with tip number one, and this will affect you right off the bat starting with character creation, understand how your your stats, your attributes work. You're talking about strength, dexterity, intelligence, etc specifically the numbers. So whatever value your stat is, it's going to give you a modifier. So a 12 in strength gives you a plus one. A 10 gives you a plus zero. An eight would give you a negative one. And these modifiers would apply to relevant roles. So let's say a, a melee attack roll will be modified by your strength modifier. So higher modifier obviously is better. And if you have a penalty, that's terrible. Now here's the clincher. 10 and 11 are zero. You have to go up to a 12 to get to a plus one. 12 and 13 are plus one. You gotta get to a 14 to get to a plus two. Similarly, going downwards, a nine is a negative one, as well as an eight. What this means is that you can't just say, oh, well, a higher number in the score is better because it doesn't work out that way. A 15 in a score is no better than a 14 unless you plan to continue as you level up to invest in that attribute to get to a 16. And similarly, going to 17, no point in that unless you plan to take it all the way to an 18, which would be a plus four. In general, you will have at least your one main stat that you'll be investing in throughout your leveling process, but then you're gonna have a number of other stats that'll be probably above average, but you're not going to keep boosting them as you level up. So just bear that in mind. If you have a stat that you know you're not going to continue to level up, don't bother putting it to an odd number. Now onto our second tip, and this is tied into ability scores, your jump. And this is actually something different from Dungeons and Dragons. Jumping can actually be a critical part of combat and just general gameplay in Baldur's Gate 3. I love that they actually made jumping useful. How far you're able to jump depends on your strength score. Sometimes you want to jump as part of exploration of the world to reach higher places. However, there's a trick that you can do in combat. You see, in combat, you're able to move X amount of feet per turn. However, if you start by jumping and then moving, your jump does count for some amount of your movement, but your total travel distance will be able to be greater than just your move speed. So this is really beneficial, for instance, for fighter types, barbarians, melee warriors with a lot of strength who are already stacking a lot of strength. These guys generally need to gap close to get into melee. So do be sure to make use of that extra movement. If that enemy is a little bit further out of reach, start by the jump and then the move. And that's the order you want to do it in. You take the jump bonus action and then the move. And this leads us into number three on the topic of bonus actions. And this is going to be a tip on learning to use the UI and inventory sorting methods. But first, just a quick brief on the action economy, which is really what I wanted to talk about here. The action economy refers to uh, this is a turn based game and your characters have a limited number of actions that they can perform on their turn. If you're ever leaving actions behind, you are potentially not being as effective as you can be. Ideally, you want to make sure you've used up all of your actions. So every character in general, you have your primary action and then you have a bonus action. Every character can generally do one bonus action per round. Depending on what your character is, you might have more options there. But at the very least, jump is always a bonus action that everyone has access to. So if you want to ensure that you're cycling through to see what your bonus actions are, there are boxes above and below the action bar user interface to help you sort. By clicking on the green circle, you can see all your actions. Then the orange triangle shows you your bonus actions. Then blue squares are spell slots, and some classes have their own resources as well. And similarly, you can sort your inventory as well. Over time, you might start to get a lot of items, and so just 
learn how to look through what you have. You can sort by a specific item. You can even search for something. Let's say in the middle of combat, you're looking for a potion or something. Definitely learn to make use of these features so that you're not forgetting about any of your resources. Now, tip number four, this was a new one to me and any D&D player. If you are wielding a shield, but you also have a a bow or some kind of ranged weapon that you would swap to, you still benefit from your shield bonus even when you swap to your bow. You don't need to have your shield out actively to gain its AC bonus, its armor class bonus. So you don't have to worry about, oh, if I swap to my bow, my armor goes down. Not the case. All right, on to number five, resting. The game introduces you to the rest mechanic fairly early on. Basically, resting is how you regain your resources, your spell slots, your hit points, your powers, everything in D&D is based off of resting. Now, the story kind of implies that if you rest too much, bad things will happen, you'll die. It's just lying to you. The game's just putting pressure on you the same way that a dungeon master would put pressure on players to have some narrative impetus to not just be constantly resting after every encounter. But really, yeah, as long as they're able to, rest as much as you can because not only does this replenish your resources but it's also where all the role play interactions happen with you and your companions and you don't want to miss out on that the more you get to know your companions the more you get to know what they like and they don't like and you know if you want to start up one of those romance options all right on to tip number six these are two of the best spells in the game guidance and bless guidance is a spell that can be used by default by clerics and druids and it's a cantrip meaning it's free to cast it doesn't consume a resource other than your action and it gives you a plus 1d4 to an ability check of your choice this is a huge buff it's basically just a free bonus that you can get all the time uh in DD, it's it's absolutely bonkers broken as well and then bless that's a level one spell so it does cost your resource this by default cleric and paladins have it and with bless you can target up to three creatures, allies, and for 10 rounds, they're going to gain a plus 1d4 bonus to their attack rolls and their saving throws. It is the concentration spell, however, so as long as you're able to maintain concentration, not take damage and not lose concentration on the spell, then this is a tremendous buff pretty much for the whole party that can last you the duration of, a, of an entire combat. Getting bonuses to attack rolls is otherwise really difficult to get. Like, you need like a magic weapon, so just basically a level 1 spell cost to do this to multiple people to get a plus one to four it is really strong all right on to tip number seven and this has to do with conversations with npcs so Baldur's gate 3 has a, a tag system where some dialogue choices are tagged to certain classes so what this means is that depending on what class you are choosing to have interact with the npcs you might have different dialogue choices pop up if you're using your barbarian you might see a barbarian specific dialogue option pop up that allows you to try to intimidate the uh, the npc for instance so you don't have to feel obliged to always just take your highest charisma character in these interactions sure having high charisma is generally beneficial with the ability to uh, persuade or deceive npcs but it's not as critical as in certain other games where Again, just because of this tag system, you will have other opportunities and possibilities open up for you that could lead to interesting and different interactions. On to tip number eight, and this is about buried treasure. Now, sometimes you'll be just walking around in the open world and you're going to see a perception check is rolled. Sometimes you pass that perception check and you find buried treasure and then you dig it up and get it. But sometimes that perception check fails. So what do you do if you see a failed perception check? You stop moving, you pull out your shovel, and you start digging, and you can generally find the treasure anyway. All right, number nine is a combat tip. Now, critical hits normally happen when you roll a 20 on a d20. In combat, you deal more damage on a crit. However, sometimes crits can be guaranteed. This is another difference from regular D&D. When enemies are under certain effects, for example, sleep, hold person, or hideous laughter, any hits against them will be crits automatically. To clarify though, these are on melee hits, or it could work with ranged attacks as well, but you have to be really close, almost within melee range. Then tip number 10, you can talk to animals. There's a spell that bards, druids, and rangers have access to by default called talk with animals or speak with animals, rather. And sometimes this can be quest relevant, but even when it isn't, who doesn't want to know what a fluffy, adorable creature is thinking? And yes, 
you can pet the dog. And that's going to wrap up this video, but I do encourage you folks to sign off in the comments with your tips for beginners in Baldur's Gate 3. Thanks for watching. Special thanks to my Twitch, Patreon, and YouTube supporters for making these videos possible. If you enjoyed this video, please share it. Check out these other videos and subscribe to join Rikers Raiders for more gaming content.